Hello and welcome to the Penguin Podcast, the place where leading authors, yes, luminaries in their field, reveal their creative process by choosing a handful of objects that have inspired them. I'm Nihal Arthur Nyker, and today I'm joined by the author of 19 books, 12 novels, Jonathan Coe, who first found international success with the novel What a Carve Up in 1994, and his novel The Rotters Club was adapted into a TV series for the BBC. Now, Jonathan's brought along his inspirational objects, including an album by Shirley Collins, a Saga Cruise newspaper and a DVD of the 2012 London Olympics. Jonathan, hello. Hi there. It's great to have you. I knew you were prolific when you couldn't remember exactly how many <laughs> books you'd written. That, that tells me that you've spent a lot of your life, well, in fact, since the age of eight, apparently, writing. Yeah. Um, then there are all the ones that never got published and all the ones that never got finished. Uh, all the ones I threw away when I was a teenager in my big kind of uh, teenage stroppy purge at the end, age of about 15 or 16. So, yeah, I have uh, spent a lot of my time, a lot of my 57 years putting words on paper. It's kind of shocking when you, uh, when you put it to me like that, but uh, I guess it's true. Maybe I should have been doing something else in that some of that time. You've been really successful at it. I think if we weren't talking at this stage and you were at a bus stop talking to yourself, having written all those books, then that would be a problem. But the fact is, <laughs> you are a very successful author, so that's good. Um, before we get into what Middle England is all about, um, something Elif Shafak said to me about, and she was um, kind of quoting Doris Lessing, was about how lonely an art form it is, that it's the kind of loneliest of art forms. Yeah. You, do you like that? Do you like solitude? Uh, yeah, that, that describes exactly what attracts me to the job, I think. And I wouldn't describe it as lonely. I would describe it as solitary, but I, but I do like solitude. And uh, yeah, it, you know, apart from anything else, it's a wonderful excuse to carve out for yourself those eight or nine or ten hours uh, of the day when you're alone in a room with the voices in your head, which sounds like a kind of recipe for craziness, but but it's what keeps me sane, really. So your new novel, uh, Middle England, is sitting right in front of me now, but it's a return to characters that you haven't revisited for 15 years, mm. um, Closed Circle in 2004, and yeah. then Rotter's Club before that in 2001. Yeah. Was it always your plan to return to them? You just didn't feel the that you'd found the right vehicle to do that, or this story presented itself and you thought, ah, oh, I know some people. <laughs> I suppose the, the main guy who has to get the credit for bringing these people back to life is a dramatist called Richard Cameron, who did an adaptation of The Ross Club for the Birmingham Rep uh, on stage in 2016. And uh, as you say, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about these characters for 15 years or so, so... I kind of sat down in the audience as an as an audience member as much as anything else, and it was so kind of weird feeling seeing them come back to life in front of my eyes and seeing somebody else's take on them, seeing aspects of them brought out that I'd forgotten about or hadn't really registered before, and aspects of them that I thought were important uh, not coming out so much. You know, it, it it shifted my perspective on the characters completely. What month was this? Because it's an important year, 2016, for this book. Uh, yeah, I think it was April. Right, I think it was okay. April. So two months before the referendum. So two months before the referendum. So that gave me the idea of reviving these characters and thinking, OK, what am I going to do with them? What kind of story am I, am I going to stick them in? And then the referendum campaign gathered momentum and then we had the vote on June 23rd. And, you know, as soon as that happened, really, I thought, right, the country is going through something quite seismic and fascinating here and I want to write about it um, but it's going to be very difficult to write about something that's happening kind of as we speak and how am I going to get any perspective on that how, how am I going to anchor myself in the middle of this kind of torrent of fast moving events that was going on all around me and I thought well you know I'll go back to those familiar characters who I've had my interest in sparked again by that uh, by that play. And I found they were kind of there ready and waiting for me and I didn't have to I didn't have to go through all the legwork, if you like, of creating a whole set of new characters, although there are some new characters in Middle England. And it was really a question of putting those two ideas together, you know, the the here and now story of the referendum and the fifteen year old characters who were still waiting for me. 
Was it the result of the referendum that was the catalyst for creating this? If the vote had gone the other way and we'd voted to remain, do you think this book would still exist? Because even the lead up to it and the conversations about it were a seismic shift. It's almost mm. as if, yes, the result has been seismic, yeah. but but what it unleashed, what it opened up in us was seismic. Uh, you know, amazingly, after however many interviews I've done for this book, you're the first person to ask me that question. That is the first time that question has been posed. Would I have written this book if uh, the country had voted Remain? Probably not, I would say off the top of my head. Uh, but let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would much rather we'd voted Remain and uh, and Middle England as a novel didn't exist and I'd put uh, the characters in, in another story. But, I th uh, but I'll tell you, I think I would have written something very similar. The decision already was made for me actually a week earlier because actually the, the event which made me want to write this book was not the vote itself but the murder of Joe Cox on the 16th of, on the 16th of June. You know, like everybody else, I'd been observing the progress of the campaign with varying degrees of, of kind of horror at what was being said and what was what was unfolding and thinking, yeah, you know, that there are a lot of very nasty divisions in this country which are being opened up. But when she was killed that afternoon, you know, this just, just kind of lead weight fell on me and I thought something very, very bad is going on. Although I didn't articulate it to myself, but I think the decision to write the book was was taken then. So then at the heart of this book is what? What did you want the reader to ask him or herself? Yeah. Well, I, I wrote it to ask myself questions, among other things, about Englishness, among, among other subjects, without realising that the question David Cameron actually asked us in that, in that referendum was, what kind of country are we? You know, I, I guess that is also the question that the book, the book poses. Um, it's, it's the story of these individual characters, but really the main character in uh, the book is the country itself and what has happened to it between 2010 and 2018. And I just wanted to portray that uh, as faithfully and also as even-handedly as I could. What fun would be derived from this book if you're a hardcore Brexiteer? <laughs> Well, a few, uh, I don't know if they're hardcore, but a few Brexiteers have read it. Fun is had at the expense of Remainers as well as uh, yeah. Brexiteers in this book. Yeah, but almost the final words that Benjamin speaks when he's a bit drunk and he raises his glass to the dinner guests he's with in France is, fuck Brexit. So I think it's pretty obvious what the authorial position is eventually. But, um, you know, I, I tried to investigate the the pro-Brexit point of view, because when I began the book, I barely understood it. I was I was so puzzled by what had made so many people vote this way. Tell us about Benjamin. Mm. You've mentioned his name a few times now. Yeah. Tell us about him. Well, I wrote a novel called The Rotters Club 20 years ago now. It was a highly autobiographical novel about my own school days at King Edward School in Birmingham. And the main character is called Benjamin Trotter, and he's he's in that book, he's really a comically exaggerated version of what I was like as a teenager, introverted, bookish, into music. And in the second book in the series, The Closed Circle, I put him through a pretty rough time. He was in his late 30s, early 40s, I think, and his marriage breaks up. He has a bit of a breakdown. And this was kind of on my conscience. And unusually for me, I, I lost faith in Middle England. And I, I sent it to a friend of mine who has uh, read all my stuff. He wrote back a very encouraging letter and so on. And and one of the things he said in the letter was, oh, I see what you're trying to do in this book. You're trying to make your peace with Benjamin. It's true. I wanted I wanted Benjamin to be happy in this book and to, and to write happiness. But Benjamin is in his mid-50s. He's given up on his romantic dreams. He's kind of given up on his artistic dreams. He's made a bit of money on the London property market. He's living reasonably comfortably in the Shropshire countryside, and he's content. You know, he's the, he's the still point which the other characters revolve around. He's he's kind of at peace with himself until, you know, family things and also the whole Brexit thing comes along and disturbs that and disturbs his equilibrium. Let's get into some objects. Mm. Starting with uh, your first object, uh, adieu to old England. Yeah. 
uh, an album by Shirley Collins. It is. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm unaware of Shirley's work, so you will have to explain it to me. Can we? We can't wasn't listen. on the Radio One playlist when I was a Radio One <laughs> DJ. <so. laughs> Should have been. Should've Should've been. Been. Should have been. We can't listen to Shirley Collins on this on this podcast. No, maybe. no, no. That's a shame. But I'd like to look at the cover. Have a look at the cover. Yeah. Uh, take the album. Actually, I'll give you. I'll gift that to you. Oh, amazing! And have a listen to the uh, to the song itself. Um, and so is this folk music? It's folk music. She's one of the great British folk singers. She's been working and recording since the early sixties. She's in her eighties now, I think. She made a series of really beautiful albums including this one, where the title track is an old British folk song called A Due to Old England, and she sings it totally unaccompanied. And the, the tune itself is so strong and so melodic and kind of heartbreaking. I can't believe, actually, it's not a, it's not a really, really well-known tune because it's, it's the kind of tune that when you hear it, you think, yeah, I've heard this hundreds of times before, but actually you haven't. It just has that kind of universality to it. And I just heard it and I thought, OK, I'm going to use that song in a book at some point. I felt an absolute sense of uh, synchronicity between what I wanted to write about and what this song expressed. And it's a very nostalgic song, but a very bitter song. And I felt there's so That's much interesting parallel. bitter nostalgia in our politics at the moment. And that kind of nostalgia has been so weaponized by politicians in the last few years. It immediately struck me that, yes, this is, this is the book that that song belongs in. So Benjamin listens to it at the very beginning of the book when he's thinking about the death of his mother, and he listens to it at the very end of the book, and he's kind of given up on his own country, and it's um, it's his adieu to old England. Why do you think it is that you were not dragged into this feeling that somehow the world has moved in a direction you don't like? So I just don't go in for it anymore. I, I you know, I, I, I think, you know, whether it's people who hanker back after the supposed glory days of World War II, whether it's uh, the 1950s before everything, in their view, got complicated by political correctness and multiculturalism or, or whatever, or even, even the kind of Corbyn-style socialists who look back at the 1970s and think that, you know, politics was, was better then. I don't, I don't really go in for any of that. There never was a golden age, and even even if there was, I think hankering after that golden age is one of the most unhelpful things you can do. So we should just uh, we should just get over it, basically, and uh, that's what Benjamin himself realizes uh, at the end of the book. Let's get back to the writing and your next object: an antique writing slope mm. belonging to your <laughs> great great grandfather. Yeah. James K. Superb. This is a kind of... Uh, where, where does this live now? Superstition thing, really. This lives in my study at home, which is a very small study. It kind of uh, dominates it. So uh, this is no good for your listeners, but this is what this is what it looks like when it's closed. Right, OK. So it's... Uh, uh, what wood is this made of, Jonathan? Do you uh, know? It's beautiful. I think it's walnut. Walnut, but I'm, but OK. I'm not sure. I feel like I'm on Antiques Roadshow yes. now, by the way. And, and, and I should really, I just I should start really take it onto Antiques you Roadshow. Really that, is, should. that is a good idea. And then when, do an author's edition. Then when you open it up, it opens up into the sloping surface okay. like this. Okay, so it's a, it's a rectangular wooden box made of uh, walnut, beautifully preserved, may I say. Your family, have, you, you clearly see it as you are the custodian of it rather than the owner of it and then it's passing it on to a yeah, next there generation. Yeah, there aren't many beautiful objects that have been passed down in my family. This is this is, this is is the main one. And I did uh, I did shell out a bit of money to have it restored and uh, spruced up a bit a few, right, okay. a few years ago. Now, I, so you open it up and it slopes. It opens up and, and then it's a leather... Is it? What, what is that surface? Yeah, a leather, that leather surface on? that you write on. And I, I mainly write in longhand and I always write some of my books using this case. It belonged to my... Great, great grandfather. Would you place a laptop on top of it now? No, you? I never do that. I never do that. I think that would. Uh, but I, I mean, I like I like writing by pen anyway. Just here, where the inkwell used to be, there's a wooden partition, and you pull it, and a secret drawer comes out. And uh, when I did that, when I first inherited this a few decades ago, I found that it contained a newspaper cutting from some local Scottish newspaper from 1891 saying that, uh, let me read this. 
On Friday evening, the workman connected with the it's pronounced Hoare, Hoare Bleachfield, met in the hotel and presented Mr J.K., manager, that's my great-great-grandfather, with a handsome writing desk as a token of the regard and esteem in which he is held by all connected with the work. Since Mr K. came here, the Bleachfield has been greatly extended. Then the account of the evening ends with this lovely sentence, with, with song and sentiment, a happy evening was spent. So there you go, song and sentiment. You can't, uh, you can't ask for a better evening than that, really, can you? Do, do you know if that had been in this secret compartment undisturbed for a very long time? I think it must have been, because it's dated... What a magical feeling to October find October the 27th, 1891, so that's a hundred and getting on for 120 years ago now. I don't come from a family of writers at all. I'm the only writer in the family uh, ever, as far as I can make out. My, my grandfather was a great reader and uh, we used to bond over that when I was a kid and we used to read Sherlock Holmes stories together and that kind of thing. And he also, he used to write me letters because he knew that I liked receiving letters. So he used to write me letters under assumed names full of kind of amazing puns and stupid jokes and this kind of thing. I don't have any of those anymore. I'm I'm really sorry to say. I don't know, I don't know what happened to them, but this writing slope, this desk gives me a great sense of uh, connection with him still. For someone who clearly, you know, embraces the diversity that London has to give, I have to say the objects you've brought today are as diverse as anything I could have imagined <laughs> from an antique writing slope, uh, an album, uh, an a cappella rendition of a song adieu to old England to this 2012 what a different age that seemed but very specifically something about 2012 tell us about your next object uh well this is a dvd of the uh, 2012 london olympic games danny boyle's masterpiece In, yeah including of course um the director's cut indeed oh. of the opening ceremony i took the decision quite early on in the writing of the book that i wanted to have a scene not just where the Olympic Games were, the opening ceremony was taking place, but there would, there would be a kind of montage where every one of the characters who I'd introduced in the book up to that point, I think there were about 10 or 12 of them, would be sitting in their various flats and houses and bedsits and holiday homes and wherever they were, watching the Olympic ceremony and reacting to it differently. I did think uh, it was something of a masterpiece, that ceremony, for which... Danny Boyle has to take the credit, and also Frank Cottrell Boyce, who who wrote a lot of it, and all the other people involved in the in the staging and designing of it. Now, life moves very fast in the world of social media. It was the seventh anniversary of the opening ceremony, and began with a few people tweeting about it and saying what a great image of Britain it projected to the world. By the end of the day on Twitter, this this viewpoint had been kind of demolished. The kind of consensus was that no, it was it was a lovey's fest. Uh, socialist. It was. It was yeah. socialist. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of the criticisms at the time. To be some fair. of the criticisms at the time, and also, you know, what about all the uh, social problems that uh, that London was experiencing at the time? It was only one year after the 2011 riots. What about all the houses that were laid waste to make way for this expensive <laughs> Olympic stadium and this kind of thing? So that kind of fascinated me because even something as kind of celebratory as the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony so quickly becomes a contested space in this in this country now. You know, if you have a view about something, someone will immediately take the opposite view and give you a right old kicking for holding your point of view. And it was fascinating watching the two things being batted backwards and forwards uh, on Twitter that day. I still think that the ceremony itself represented a great imagining of the country that Britain had been and could be. And whether or not it was anchored in the social reality of Britain in July 2012, well, obviously it wasn't, because the kind of fractures and frustrations and divisions which led to the Brexit referendum were well in place and were well up and running by 2012. But still, as a vision, as a kind of statement around this vexed issue of national identity, I thought it was really impressive. And I wanted it to be a kind of centrepiece of the early half of the book. It's a key moment, I think, in the history of the last 10 or 12 years. I also think it gave a message to the world about confidence and multiculturalism, dynamism, creativity, etc., which then may have, but four years later, really shocked the world. It felt to me 
that we showed a very different face to the world in 2012 than we did in 2016. Maybe it's maybe it's as simple as that. You go back to Benjamin, actually, because are you done with him now? I think what I've realised about him is that he's, as a character, he's necessary to me at certain points. I mean, all my books are different. But The Rogers Club, The Closed Circle and Middle England are, are quite similar in a way because they're, they're all snapshots, uh, not just of that group of characters, but of the country itself at different moments. The 1970s, in the case of The Rogers Club, the turn of the millennium and the beginning of the Iraq War in the case of The Closed Circle, and the Brexit years, I suppose we can call them, in, uh, in Middle England. And... Uh, I'm sure I will want want to write a book like that again. Not for a while, actually, because I've kind of shot my bolt on that front with Middle England for the time being, I think. Uh, and when I do, then I will come back to, to Benjamin, definitely. Let's get to a final object. Yeah. Uh, a copy of Today. What is Today? I remember there was a, now, there was a defunct newspaper called Today. It was back a newspaper in the days. called Today, wasn't yeah, it? Yes, that's true. Days, yeah. yeah. Um, this is not that newspaper. This is the daily newspaper. I don't know if they're still publishing it, but this is the daily newspaper of Saga Cruises. Yes. And Which I would assume you're too young to really know about. Isn't Saga Cruises something that's... Incorrect. Incorrect, because you only have to be 50 to go on a Saga Cruise. Oh, okay. And in fact, one of the things I discovered on my experience with Saga Cruises is that they have a slightly younger demographic than most cruise companies because people who go on cruises tend to be well over 50 in the first place. But five years ago, I had the very great pleasure of being invited to be the writer in residence on a Saga cruise, uh, which went uh, around the Baltic states. Uh, we went to Sweden, Finland, St. Petersburg, Tallinn, Copenhagen, a few other places. Why does and it need a writer in residence? You may well ask. You may well ask. And I think the I think the conclusion they came to at the end of this short lived experiment was that it did not it did not need a writer in residence. But you'd cash your cheque by that stage. But I'd cash my cheque by that good, stage, or good. rather I'd I'd had twelve very pleasant days in a first class cabin by that Love by that, that stage. So yes, there's a scene uh, <laughs> I thought I had to use this experience somehow in uh, in Middle England. So there's a, there are a couple of chapters where my my art history lecturer, Sophie, gets invited to uh, to give some lectures on, I don't call it a saga cruise, I call it a legend cruise. And at the very beginning of this chapter, she has a, a moment, which is what also happened to me, where you're taken to see the cruise director, whose job is to organise all the entertainment on the cruise. And it was a very nice guy in my case called John Parton. And uh, he had not really, as far as I could make out, been forewarned that I was coming on the cruise. This had been cooked up between, <laughs> between Saga and Penguin. And when I got there, he was kind of slightly shocked. And we were in his cabin and there were, there were ventriloquists, there were jugglers, there was an Elvis impersonator and all this kind of thing. And everybody was getting up and telling him what they did. And he said, yeah, you can go on on six o'clock on Tuesday evening and this kind of thing. And then he came to me and said, what do you do? And I said, well, I kind of write novels. <laughs> And he he could just his his face sort of fell and he he's well you know what am I going to do with that so he in there was also um, the literary journalist from the Sunday Times Peter Kemp was also on board so we did um, we did a kind of Q and A slot together here it is advertised eight forty five on the evening of the twenty fifth of August two thousand and fourteen tonight literary journalist Peter Kemp will interview our special guest. Special guest author John Van Coe and I was on uh, just before uh, a thing called Love Me Tender, an electrifying tribute to the music of the king of rock and roll, Mr. Elvis Presley. So basically, I was I was the warm up act to this Elvis Presley uh, tribute <laughs> tribute show. I'll be honest, I didn't do a very good job of warming the audience up in readiness for Elvis. There was a kind of audible sigh of relief among the audience when uh, when Peter and I left the stage and and Elvis took over. Because the the ship's entertainment was great, actually. I I, I really enjoyed it. If 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 you want, twelve days is quite a solid amount of time to be at sea. I mean, I know you dock and then you wander around and stuff, but that's quite. A lot you of time. do, but it was especially it, in a first class cabin. That's pretty good. It was really kind of fascinating because I love these kind of enclosed environments, which which turn out to be kind of microcosms of of 
of bigger things. There were set pieces throughout Middle England. There's funerals and there's yeah, weddings yep. and yeah. And uh, the account of the cruise in in uh, Middle England is not really based on this saga cruise. It's more based on. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember reading about an Elvis. <laughs> It's more based on a cruise that my uh, my agent went on and told me about, and and he had uh, he had a pretty rough time with passengers who he didn't uh, get on with. I just published a book called Expo Fifty Eight at the time, and there was a copy of this book in every single cabin on the ship. It was quite a small ship; I think there were about four hundred cabins. That was interesting because people were quite offended by this. They felt it was quite and quite an imposition. I, I, they they would come up to me on the deck with a copy of my novel and said, you know, I found this in my cabin. Do I do I have to read it? I mean, I brought my I brought I brought my like own books. Like you were a head teacher. Yes, <laughs> I brought my own books. Why do I? I don't want to read yours. <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's just a gift from the it's just a gift from the publisher. You know, do 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 with it what you will. <laughs> it sounds like such a bizarre twelve days. It was a very very bizarre twelve days, but a very enjoyable twelve days and a very and very interesting. I'd do it again, actually. I would, I would do it again, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure the scheme's still running. Well, okay. Well, look, there are plenty of other cruise companies in the world. That's true. Who have yet to discover the delights <laughs> of a writer in residence. <laughs> so, you know, we can make that happen. Yeah. Um, I guess as a keen people watcher, and surely every novelist has to be a keen watcher of people. Yes. It's a great place to watch people, a cruise ship, isn't it? It is a great place. And, and yeah, people people start to behave differently after they've been cooped up with each other for a week or two. Saga passengers, I have to say, they were very nice and very well behaved. There was a story about another cruise. I don't know if you saw this in the newspaper. Yeah, it was a massive fight. There was it? a huge punch-up. Yeah. Precipitated, I think, by, by a passenger who appeared at a party dressed as a clown. And this gave me shivers down my spine when I read it because the, there's a whole subplot in Middle England about two clowns, one of whom supports Brexit and one of whom supports uh, Remain, who uh, are such deadly rivals that they end up kind of having a physical fight with each other. Yeah, there's, there was there was patriotic singing apparently, whatever whatever that mm. whatever that means. And then uh, yeah, a fight broke out and chairs were broken and blood was shed and all this kind of thing. So. Um, you know, I I got off pretty lightly, I think. Yeah, with talking my nice, getting off. Well behaved saga people. It's it's you know to have that happen when you're in a place where you can just walk out of and get in a taxi and go home is, yes, is bad enough. Thing, yeah. But to to be at sea and have that happening is altogether different. Yeah. Um, scenario. Look, let's go let's go to the beginning of the novel, uh, Jonathan, when Sophie's in the audience uh, at a literary Q and A where Lionel Hampshire and a French writer discuss national stereotypes. Now, let's take a listen to that bit from the audiobook now. Well, let's look at the political world. Our National Front commands the support of about 25% of the French people. En France, quand on regarde les Britanniques, on est frappé de constater que, contrairement à d'autres pays européens, vous êtes épargné par ce phénomène, le phénomène du Parti populaire d'extrême droite. In France, we look at the British and we're impressed that, uh, uh, unlike most other European countries, uh, you, you don't have this phenomenon, a uh, popular party of the far right. Vous avez le UKIP, bien sûr, mais d'après ce que je comprends, c'est un parti qui cible un seul problème et qui n'est pas pris au sérieux en tant que force politique. You have uh, UKIP, of course, but my understanding is that they are a single-issue party who are not taken seriously as a political force. Sohan waited for him to elaborate further, and when he didn't, turned to Lionel Hampshire and asked him rather desperately, Would you care to comment on that? <clears throat> well, said the eminent novelist, as a rule I'm wary of these uh, broad generalizations about national character, but... I think Philippe has probably put his finger on something here. I'm not an uncritically patriotic person, far from it. But there is something in the English characters I admire, and Philippe is right about it. I mean, our love of moderation, our immoderate love of moderation, if you like. This choice phrase plopped into the reverent silence of the room and set off a ripple of laughter. We're a pragmatic nation, politically. Extremes of left and right don't appeal to us. And we're also essentially tolerant. That's why 
The multicultural experiment in Britain has, by and large, been successful, with one or two minor blips. I wouldn't presume to compare us to the French in this regard, of course, but certainly speaking personally, these are the things I most admire about the British, our moderation and our tolerance. What a load of self-satisfied bullshit, said Sohan. But, regrettably, he did not say it on stage. Uh, that was Middle England written by my guest, Jonathan Cohen, read there by the amazing Rory Kinnear. Uh, just to remind us to subscribe to the Penguin Podcast so you don't miss new free episodes. Yes, free, my favourite price, twice a month. You can find us at sites like iTunes or Spotify via the podcast app on your smartphone or on your Alexa-enabled device. And I must tell you, tickets are on sale for our Penguin Podcast live event with Mallory Blackman at the Lowry in Manchester on the 31st of August. Wow. How much fun did you have writing that? That was a lot of fun. Um, one of the things I like doing when I write and try to do when I write is to take the piss out of myself. And I've I don't think I've ever said anything quite as kind of fatuous as, as Lionel Hampshire says in that uh, in that section. But uh, you know, particularly when I've been promoting the books abroad in France and Italy and places, I do tend to get asked quite a lot of questions about the national character and what do I consider myself English? What do I consider the in essentially English qualities? And this is the kind of nonsense you sometimes find yourself uh, coming out with. Do you think that? the path back to a sense of moderation still exists? Uh, in this country, yeah. generally? Well, I mean, look, you have to look at Hungary and Turkey and Russia and America to, to see it as a global phenomenon. Yeah. This isn't just something that the British or indeed the English are... I did, I did an event with uh, John Lanchester a few weeks ago and... We were talking about the audience Q&A and we, we said, I wonder if we're going to get the hope question because it's become a real phenomenon of uh, audience Q&As recently that at some point somebody will say, do we have hope? Can we be optimistic about anything? And sure enough, we did get the hope question. And uh, John gave a very good answer, I thought, which, he, which is that he felt, we, he felt we had a moral obligation to be optimistic because despair is too easy. Oh, pessimism is a luxury. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's what he was. I yeah. think that's what he was really arguing. And I, I thought that was very true and, and uh, a very worthwhile thing to say. I, I don't know. I mean, moderation is a problematic word because it is like centrist. You know, everybody hates centrists these days because we're the people who cause this problem in the first place. Apparently, depending on uh, you know, depending on who's who's taking the blame on on that particular day. We certainly can't go back to the pre-2016 status quo because something like the vote for Brexit was was bound to happen. Something something was going to crack, something was going to give under the tensions that Britain was labouring under in the years running up to 2016. But if we're going to find a way forward, I don't see how we can do it without without compromise and civil engagement with other people's points of view really i mean I, you know otherwise we're just going to we're just going to become more entrenched and more extreme and polarized and there's no there's no hope in that direction i don't think jonathan it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you today and uh, that's jonathan co coming much. coming to a cruise ship near you <laughs> I hope so yeah definitely available for Elvis support acts anytime you want me <laughs> <laughs>